Hello there, and welcome back to English 3020. This week we'll be looking at the short stories of Susan Glaspell, F. Scott Fitzgerald, William Faulkner, and Alice Walker. And the short story is an interesting genre, as it takes a few words and manages to pack a powerful punch in those few words. One of the shortest stories in the English language, For Sale, Baby Shoes, Never Worn, has wrongly been attributed to Ernest Hemingway, but did spark an interest in a new genre of short fiction called flash fiction, where writers express their ideas in as few as six words. Short stories often have all the complexity and power of a novel, but come wrapped up in a compact and succinct package. Our authors for this week are all prolific writers of various genres, you know, being famous for novels and other short stories. We'll be taking a look at their more succinct tales. So join me this week as we study how these authors pack so much meaning into so few pages. This week, I'm going to be talking about the authors chronologically. This is not going to match the order they are in on the syllabus, but that's okay. You can really read them in any order. You don't have to go chronologically. Susan Glassbell is the earliest of our short story authors for this week. She was born in 1876 and died in 1948. And during her lifetime, she wore a lot of different hats, had a lot of different occupations. She was an actor, a director, a theater producer, a playwright, a fiction writer of both novels and short stories, and also a journalist. She ended up publishing more than 50 short stories throughout her lifetime, as well as nine novels and 14 plays. So she was a very prolific writer. And in cases similar to The Awakening, um, you know, things from Zora Neale Hurston, feminist scholars really helped bring her work back into the limelight. And the pieces we are reading this week for her, the play Trifles and the short story A Jury of Her Peers, are her most famous works. Her hometown is Davenport, Iowa, and before and after attending college, she was a journalist. Um, she went to Drake University in Des Moines, and she eventually, though, turned away from journalism and began writing fiction at the age of 25 in 1901. She married a theatrical director and writer named George Cram Cook, who was really interested in modernist ideas and the experimentation of the modernist movement. After moving to the East Coast, the couple collaborated on many projects and founded the Washington Square Players and Provincetown Players, and that latter group, Edna St. Vincent Millay, who we read last week, was a part of. And the Provincetown Players kind of had this goal of creating a unique American theater by staging plays written only by Americans. In the early 1900s, um, William Butler Yeats and other authors and artists in Ireland, and the Republic of Ireland, Southern Ireland, did a similar thing with the Abbey Theatre in really kind of an attempt to create this national theatre that celebrated um, Irish creativity and writing. And so we kind of saw a similar movement with the Provincetown players. Along with celebrating that American artistry, they also kind of sought to be experimental and to kind of explore the different things that theatre could do. Her husband, though, did die in 1924. She had a second relationship with another novelist and playwright named Norman Matson, but that ended in 1932. In 1930, one of her plays won a Pulitzer Prize, and Susan Glassbell is part of the realism movement in some of her dramatic works, especially Trifles and A Jury of Her Peers. Her short stories were a bit more formulaic, often with happy endings, but we do kind of see her turn to realism later on in her writing. We could also consider her a regionalist. Many of our more contemporary writers in this class, so the more recent ones, um, used aspects of realism in their work. And realism and regionalism often overlap, because obviously if you're trying to describe a place accurately and truthfully, um, you know, they're going to be using realistic aspects and realistic description in your writing. And the main goal of realism is to portray the world how it actually is in the current time with accurate detail. And again, I kind of mentioned this before, but it seeks to avoid overly idealized or romanticized or nostalgic descriptions. It really wants to be as true to life as possible, which is kind of a trend we've seen continued you know, in fiction today as well. Kind of this attempt to capture real life on the page so that you can read a book and almost like you're seeing, you know, this slice of life or this piece of a world. Events are usually ones that could actually happen in real life, and there's an increased focus on character and kind of internal mental states and mental development. We also see an increased focus on everyday people, not just heroic, wealthy, or elite individuals. When realism hit the theatrical scene, this marked a really drastic change from the overly dramatic plots and flowery language of the plays that had come before. This also ushered in the acting style we are more familiar with, 
where actors actually try to portray characters realistically as if they were real people on a stage, rather than with very grand and sweeping gestures, dramatic speeches, you know, over enunciation, you know, unnatural speech patterns. Um, in the old days of theater, you know, actors would kind of overact. And just kind of as a note for the reading for this week, the play Trifles, again, is a one-act play that Susan Glaspell wrote in 1916. So that is first. She later turned that into the short story, The Jury of Her Peers, in 1917. So they are telling the same story, but in two kind of different ways of writing. F. Scott Fitzgerald, arguably one of the most famous American writers, wrote extensively during the Jazz Age of America. And the Jazz Age is also known as the Roaring Twenties, and really kind of took place, you know, at the beginnings of the end of World War I, saw its heyday, you know, in the period between 1920 and 1929, and then really came crashing down in 1929 along with the stock market and the beginning of the Great Depression. And if we remember from a few weeks ago, the Jazz Age is happening at the same time as the Harlem Renaissance, so we're seeing kind of a lot of different activities in a lot of different sectors of the United States population at this time. Prohibition was also going on in this time. There's also the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and an anti-immigrant focus with legislation actually passed to limit the number of people who could immigrate to the United States. During this time, there was also kind of an increased focus on urban life as cities really saw the most glamour and action during the Jazz Age. And for the first time in American history at this point, more people lived in cities than on farms. So kind of, again, we see a really big rush to the cities, a big kind of urban boom that has continued into, you know, the modern day. And in the Roaring Twenties, we saw an increasing economic prosperity for many Americans, which resulted in more leisure time, as well as more consumerism, as they had more money to spend on luxury and leisure goods. Jazz music also became wildly popular at this time, and many technological advancements such as telephone, radio, you know, um, recording devices, film, and automobiles added really to the frenzy and the consumerism of this era. Women were also pushing and fighting for more independence and equality in this time. I mean, we saw the rise of the flapper and kind of women breaking out of the strict rules and expectations that they'd experienced before. And this kind of, you know, increased demand for independence and equality really kind of came off of the success of the 19th Amendment, which had been passed in 1919, giving women the right to vote. So despite all the progress in this era, there was also a lot of kind of pushback from the old generation and the more kind of conservative populations of the generation. And during this time, like I said, we saw a rise in anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, we saw a rise in racism with things like the KKK. And we also saw the first attacks on the theory of evolution, uh, the infamous Scopes Monkey Trial, where a school teacher was sued for teaching evolution, which was breaking the law in his state, uh, was also happening during this time. And like the modernist movement, the, the Jazz Age was kind of born from the ruins of World War I. People really kind of overcompensated for the death and destruction of the war by living extravagantly and partying hard. It is important to note, though, that this opulence and this decadence and this kind of overconsumption and overpartying was only available to those who could afford it and those, you know, who kind of were in these urban centers. So the entire United States really wasn't um, necessarily experiencing all these things. It was really kind of those who had wealth and money to spend. And during this time, you know, we also saw a huge gap develop between the new and old generations, as the old generations were kind of resistant to this really fast and sudden change, while many in the new generation and the younger generations were kind of pushing for this development and this change in American society. F. Scott Fitzgerald, most famous for his novel, The Great Gatsby, was born in 1896 and died in 1940. His full name is Francis Scott Key Fitzgerald, and he was born in St. Paul, Minnesota, but grew up in Buffalo and Syracuse, New York. His family was not very well off economically, and his aunt had to fund his education at a Catholic boarding school. He was later able to attend Princeton University. He was, though, able to participate in literary and dramatic extracurricular activities, which brought him into contact with other intellectuals and kind of, you know, helped uh, get him started on the track of writing. And Fitzgerald left college to join the army, but the war ended before he was deployed and saw active service. He met his infamous wife, Zelda, while stationed in Montgomery, Alabama, though she originally rejected him. He published his first book, This Side of Paradise, and became a famous best-selling author at the age of 24. He married Zelda a week after the novel came out. And the couple lived a hard-partying lifestyle, um, lived very extravagantly, and both she and Scott are really kind of considered symbols of the splendor, decadence, and overconsumption of the Jazz Age. 
Both Zelda and Scott were sort of celebrities at the time in America, as she was from a wealthy family and he was a famous author. So their exploits and kind of their craziness was well observed and documented by the American public. They had a daughter, Frances Scott Fitzgerald, um, in 1921. And the Fitzgeralds later, though, moved to Paris, where living was cheaper after the war, because they had kind of fallen on hard times because of their extravagant lifestyle. While there, they met Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein, and Ernest Hemingway, other major writers of the period. And while he was in Europe was when he actually wrote The Great Gatsby. And Fitzgerald was a very prolific short story writer, and he actually made very good money for his short stories. But they really could still not overcome the massive amount of debt they had from their kind of overconsumption. He turned to alcohol and kind of became an alcoholic, and Zelda had a mental breakdown. She was later diagnosed with schizophrenia and spent most of the rest of her life in various mental institutions. And Fitzgerald moved back to the United States and actually began doing some writing for Hollywood and was kind of you know, on a good track in terms of his career and his life. But his health was really in decline because that heavy drinking had caught up with him and he ended up dying of a heart attack at the age of 44. And he wrote uh, Babylon Revisited, the piece we're reading for this week, right after the stock market crashed, signaling the beginning of the Great Depression. And Fitzgerald's work is interesting because it has a lot of sort of correlations and relations to aspects of his own life, but it is not strictly autobiographical. But that some of the kind of the characters and the events that happen in his novels and short stories are very kind of reminiscent of certain things that happened in F. Scott Fitzgerald's life. With William Faulkner, we return to our more Southern writers. He was born in 1897 and died in 1962. And he was born near and then raised in Oxford, Mississippi. Faulkner's father was rather distant. He enjoyed hunting, drinking, and kind of hanging out with his hunting buddies. His mother, on the other hand, though, uh, really kind of had more literary leanings. And she kind of proved a stronger influence on Faulkner, who the book says was her favorite of her four sons. And Faulkner was also close to his maternal grandmother, who died when Faulkner was 10. So Faulkner had a lot of kind of female influence in his life and not as much um, of a male role model. He dropped out of high school in 1915 and only had one year of study at the University of Mississippi. He worked several jobs that he got from, you know, family connections, but none really felt like the right fit. And in a move straight out of a soap opera, his high school sweetheart ended up marrying someone else, and Faulkner ended up enlisting in the British Royal Flying Corps and went to train in Canada. But like Fitzgerald, the war ended before he could actually see any action. And Faulkner started off his writing career by publishing poetry that drew from more kind of traditional forms and structures. But he then went to New Orleans for a while where he met another major American author, Sherwood Anderson, who told him to write prose and use his region for inspiration. Faulkner then went to Europe for a while and returned to Oxford and married his high school sweetheart, whose name was Estella Oldham, who had divorced her first husband. They ended up living and buying a ruined mansion that they began to restore, uh, kind of, you know, a mansion from the old antebellum South. And he did some work as a scriptwriter in Hollywood, but he's sort of most famous for his novels, which are very experimental with challenging prose and plot organization. And most of his novels are interconnected through a fictional version of his region named Yaknipatawa County. And characters or families in one book often turn up in other books, or they are linked by just location, you know, or kind of history and sort of time, and so there's sort of all these interwoven threads between the books, which makes his work even more complex and rich. And A Rose for Emily is set in this county, in this world. The Grierson family to which she belongs is kind of one of the wealthier families in this fictional version of his hometown. And Faulkner ended up gaining a pretty high level of national recognition after the publication of The Portable Faulkner in 1946. And he already had a pretty solid and influential reputation in France where they really admired his work. Faulkner later won a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. He also was awarded a Pulitzer for Fiction. And then he died of a heart attack at the age of 65. Alice Walker is our final author for this week, and she is one of our first and few authors who is still alive at present. So she was born in 1944 and is about 73 years old right now. Her hometown is Eatonton, Georgia, and she was actually the first African-American woman to win a Pulitzer for fiction. She was the youngest of eight children born to a maid mother and sharecropper father. At the age of eight, her brother accidentally shot her right eye with a BB gun. The family could not afford to get to the doctor until a week later as they didn't have a car available to them, and she ended up suffering from partial blindness um, due to the accident, but also the fact that she was not able to receive quick medical treatment. This incident led to a growing rift between Alice and her father, 
as well as caused her to kind of shift from a more outgoing personality to a more withdrawn and self-conscious personality. And she actually began to suffer with mental health issues like depression and suicidal thoughts, things she would suffer with for the rest of her life, um, as the other children teased her for the scar tissue in her eye. There is a kind of silver lining to this episode, though, because it did lead her to turn to writing to express herself. She attended segregated schools, but graduated as valedictorian of her high school. She received a scholarship to go to Spelman College and became really involved in the civil rights movement. She then received another scholarship to go to Sarah Lawrence College in New York, where she was one of very few African-American students and one of even fewer female African-American students. And she spent a year as an exchange student studying in Africa, so she kind of could draw from a lot of different cultural experiences in her work. She married a civil rights attorney named Melvin Leventhal in 1967. She and Leventhal, though, did eventually have a daughter named Rebecca together, and this is Alice Walker's only child. They ended up separating in 1976, her and her husband. And, you know, for most of her life, she worked full-time as a writer of various genres, as well as teaching. Her most famous work is The Color Purple. She writes extensively about gender and race, as well as the intersection of the two, and is really credited with bringing the work of Zora Neale Hurston back into the limelight and the American canon. She champions what she calls womanism, which she uses to define a black or woman of color feminist. Many women of color find feminism an exclusionary movement, as historically it was really a segregated movement that mostly focused on white women and was not very welcoming to other points of view and other people of color. And her most recent major publication was in 2010. Um, you know, so she's still kind of producing work and still has you know, some of those creative juices flowing. 